My name is um, Harley Williams. I'm the director of operations for Bexley City Schools. And uh, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me tonight while I share the operational and safety side um, of the start of our hybrid in-person learning. Uh, I think it's important that I begin with um, that I, I'm sharing uh, operational safety um, and I'm not uh, going to discuss a lot of the academic side of our return to in-person learning. And I know a lot of questions I received um, were, were those types of questions. Um, I will make sure those questions get to the right person and um, we get answers to those to you as soon as possible. Um, I hope that those who join this webinar, uh, hoping to, uh, maybe we're hoping that they might learn more about the academic aspect of our program, decide to stay with us, because I believe that you'll find this presentation uh, worth your time. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and will be posted on our district website for those who could not attend or have to leave early. Um, and I guess I'll give you a little introduction of myself why people still might be joining our, our presentation here. Um, I'm embarking, I believe, on my 21st year with the district. Um, formerly served as a middle school principal for 10 years and a high school principal for eight years. Um, I guess the, the most important thing I want you to take away from my introduction is that um, I remain as committed to the safety and security of your children as I did when my three daughters went to school here. Uh, and I've uh, we've been working, uh, our whole team has been working extremely hard to get this together. We're just thinking in the back of my mind that there were about six months ago is when we actually started our, uh, the COVID school closure time frame. And there's been a lot going on in those uh, six months. And I joked yesterday with our leadership team that uh, fortunately from the operations part of our system, COVID hasn't had much of an impact. And obviously that was a joke because it's impacted everything that we've done. And uh, the six months here has flown by. And as I also said yesterday, it's been the toughest six months uh, professionally of my career. And there's so much responsibility and so much learning at stake. Um, so what I do anytime I'm in a situation like that, I try to surround myself by a lot of smart people and do as much reading and learning as I can. And uh, I want to share with you today um, our collective wisdom. Um, this is certainly not just things that are coming from me. Uh, we're trying our best to look at best practices and uh, research and making sound decisions. Um, and we're flexible. We, we're, we keep We'll, we'll keep reviewing this and I'll talk about that later on in the presentation. So yes, uh, in case you've been wondering, we have spent all summer preparing for a return to in-person learning in our hybrid environment. Uh, currently the transition from distance to hybrid is scheduled for Monday, September 21st. And, and that'll be here before you know it. Well, I'm trying to figure out how I get the slide to shift. There we go. Okay, um, before I begin to share all the steps we've taken to prepare to open our schools during this COVID um, uh, pandemic, I'd like to spend a few minutes discussing the changes we made over the summer to improve our overall general safety and security plan. Unfortunately, in today's world, we still must prepare for non-COVID threats uh, to our staff and our students while at school. Last year, we implemented our school intruder procedures that we call lockout, takeout, or get out. I, I offered those in a certain order, but uh, there is no order. These, can, these are, could be stated in any order. But these are options that our staff and older students can choose from when faced with a school intruder alert. The option chosen should be based on the information known about the school threat at the time. Uh, for our younger students, they will obviously just follow the lead of their teacher. So, well, you know, that's a tough topic to begin with, but so what do we know about school shootings? Well, we know that there's not been a, a death 
due to a school shooting for anyone who's been secured behind a locked door. So one option everyone has when faced with this alarm in our school is to get behind a locked door as quickly as possible or lock out the threat. Another option students and police have during the school intruder alarm is to get out. If the situation allows and staff and students can opt to exit the building and run to safety, they can run home or they can run to an identified rally point. At the rally point, attendance will be taken. We will send people there as well. Attendance will be taken. Parents will be notified to report and pick up their child. Those that go directly home will be communicated with and expected to contact the school to announce that they are safe uh, when the opportunity does present itself. Um, just our rally points have been identified. Uh, for example, the, for Maryland Avenue students and staff, it's a Good Shepherd Church there on Maryland Avenue. For the Cassingham Complex, it's a Beth, Bexley United Methodist or St. Catharines. Uh, for the Cassingham Complex, as I said, or uh, Bexley Public Library for Montrose. The last option in this um, is used only as a last resort, and that is uh, takeout. Uh, when, when faced with no other option, um, everyone must defend themselves in any way possible with anything you can find at your disposal. Um, we will not physically train this option, but it will be discussed with our older students uh, and, and certainly and not going to be shared with our younger students. And drills during the COVID uh, era will certainly look different. It's it, the days of us ringing an alarm and sending uh, groups of students in the hallways all at once to go out different doors and, and prescribed doors uh, will, will, will not occur uh, as they did last year. It will certainly uh, occur when appropriate and uh, when required but um, we're gonna be emphasizing a lot of tabletop exercises this year. And what a tabletop exercise is, is they're just basically age appropriate discussions that the staff have with students around a specific scenario. So it could be instead of packing everyone in our um, downstairs in the, in the basement, when we're very close to one another during the COVID era, um, we might just talk about where we will go for a tornado drill, point out where the tornado um, shelter areas are in the building. Uh, have those kind of conversations instead of actually going down and uh, practicing uh, that drill. Um, but we'll balance all that out with their educational needs, safety needs, and uh, as well as the, the training that's required for us. Well, well, we'll try to find a good balance for that this year. Um, there are other safety terms that we'll, we have um, that we're going to offer this year. The first is the reverse evacuation. A reverse evacuation is used when there's a threat nearby that causes us to bring our students who are outside back into the building. Once inside, we'll probably either move into a modified lockdown or a shelter in place, depending on the situation. We'll talk about those uh, soon here. Another term we'll use is shelter in place. An example when we might use a shelter in place would be during a tornado warning. We would direct all students report to an area of the building that's marked with, as a tornado shelter area, and then we would shelter in place until it was safe to come out. A third term our students will be trained on and, and need to know is what we call modified lockdown. And it's important you know this as well because a modified doc, lockdown is most often used when uh, there's an indirect threat to our school that happens to be nearby. For example, a lot of some you know, Castleman Complex and Montrose are near a lot of banks and occasionally those banks are robbed. And we'll get alerted uh, about a robbery or that the suspect has, has fled on foot. And um, get the, when we get that alert, we go into a modified lockdown. But first we usually go into a reverse evacuation, bring everyone in and then go into a modified lockdown. Why it's important for parents to know this is that during a modified lockdown, no one get, is permitted into our building until the threat is passed or the Bexley police announce we can return to normal operations. All doors are locked. No one gets in, no one gets out of the building until the outside threat is, has been, uh, we've been cleared to do so. And the last term I want you to know is, is a stay put. It's um, used when we uh, need to clear the hallways 
Um, students must remain in the rooms until it's announced they can leave. In the past, we used stay put mainly when there's been a medical emergency in the hallway and we need um, the hallways cleared um, to get emergency personnel in our hallways. Um, as far as other general school safety things, we have other uh, new enhancements. And pardon the typo there, I added one uh, just a few minutes ago, but I'd see I didn't change it from the three to a four. Uh, we have four new enhancements to our school safety model. Um, first one is Staff Alerter. Um, this one is a, a pretty cool program. Um, staff Alerter is an alarm and communication system that's instant that we've installed in each of our buildings. Um, we now have a beacon uh, and an alarm system installed in hallways that will flash and sound whenever we have a school intruder in our building thus alerting students to either lock out, get out, or take out. It will also notify staff and students via email and or text of the threat as well, so we can stay in constant communication with uh, both staff and employees at that time. Uh, and another thing that's nice about this uh, process is that the, um, or they can be initiated by multiple people from multiple locations in our building. In the past, we've had to really rely on our PA system, and we're very excited that we have this system now that'll communicate very quickly. Uh, Mr. Eikenberry uh, has wrote and received a grant for 40,000 that allows us to expand these products and services in the near future. And one of the things that they're also working on is a, um, a prototype that would allow um, to take over our computer screens whenever something, whenever an alert goes out, we would send that out. Um, Another uh, thing we'd like to share right now is a new digital radio system. Uh, the feature I like most about these radios, I won't go into all the, the, the gimmicks and things that we have on these systems and how uh, wonderful they are for us, but I think it's important to know we've, we have a, a channel directly on the radio that we can um, select and immediately be placed on the uh, Bexley Police Department SOS channel. And we place the radio in the dispatcher's office so that whenever we call um, from one of our radios, it, it goes directly into the dispatcher's office. And they're constantly monitoring that channel. Um, so that's, that's a nice new addition to as well. We've also installed a new visitor management system at Montrose and Maryland. And Mo our Montrose and Maryland parents should like this a lot. Um, we made it, made it set up so it's similar to what we have at Castingham. And that is, we're not allowing people in the building until we can vet and screen them from the outside first. So now, uh, in Maryland and Montrose, visitors will have to have their driver's license scanned while outside the building. There, there'll be a vestibule that they'll walk into that'll be unlocked, and then the doors going into the building will be locked. And that's where this uh, scanning and vetting will take place. And then once the, uh, um, secretaries or whoever is uh, vetting uh, the visitor, they can unlock the doors electronically to allow the visitor into the building. Uh, so visitors that are entering Maryland, uh, the doors will, will enter, the those who want to enter Maryland uh, will enter through the doors facing Maryland Avenue, and those uh, who would wish to enter Montrose will enter the doors facing Main Street now. We've also added a new phone system in the Cassingham complex, and one of the features of this phone is that we now have direct contact or intercom buttons from each classroom directly into the building office, which will help um, facilitate uh, and speed up our communication whenever there's times of emergency. Uh, they'll be installed in Maryland and Montrose in the near future. Well, let's start transitioning now to our COVID information. Uh, I thought I'd begin with a question I get asked most often, and that is, what will we do if someone associated with one of our schools tests positive for COVID? Well, um, here's the answer. Our school nurses and I will serve as a district's, district's contact tracing team, and we'll begin preliminary contact tracing until Franklin County Public Health becomes involved and identify and communicate with possible exposures. Uh, we will contact and report the positive cases to the Franklin County Public Health. And as per the recent uh, Ohio Department of Health Director's orders dated September 3rd, we will notify appropriate parents 
and staff and update our COVID dashboard on our website. It is not something that we'll necessarily share with the whole school community. Again, we'll, we'll share it only with the appropriate parents and staff that, um, that need to know that information. But the, it's, it's viewed publicly on the COVID dashboard on our website. Finally, we'll clean and disinfect all applicable areas. And it's important to note, and I can't emphasize this enough, that we will protect the privacy of all individuals involved. So let's take a minute here to discuss contact tracing. We will contact trace for anyone who has COVID-like symptoms for three or more days or has tested positive for COVID. The details of this process can be found in our BCSD Parent Student COVID-19 Guide. Uh, those identified as having close physical contact will, with a sick individual will be notified to quarantine. If your student is not asked to quarantine, your student should return to school and continue with their protective measures as usual. Close contact is defined as being within six feet of distance of an ill person for an accumulative 15 minutes on a given day. So wearing a mask is known to protect everyone involved, but wearing a mask is not a variable considered during contact tracing. That is why we will continue to emphasize everyone to keep six feet of distancing when they're on school grounds. And it's, it's not up here, but I, I, I wonder if you know what the second most asked question I receive is. Well, that question is, uh, will we close school if someone tests positive for COVID? Um, the answer to that is no. Um, we, I mean, it's, it, if there's a spread or if there's attendance issues that prevent us from functioning as a school, certainly we'll, we'll certainly have that, that we'll be in consultation and conversations with the Franklin County Public Health when that, when that happens. Um, we put a lot of steps in place to prevent the spread. And if our plan works, uh, we, should do, we, should do, we should be successful in mitigating the, the spread of this. So a COVID virus will not automatically close a school or a classroom. Uh, this, this slide announces the goal for our summer preparedness work and, and basically, like I said, it's, it's a big responsibility. Uh, and it's, you know, it's 2,000 people um, uh, in this school and uh, it's, 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 a, it's a big task and, and, and I know there's a continuum of people in regards to safety, but um, we're, 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 treating, we're treating this very seriously and we plan accordingly. And so our goal, and, uh, and I'll be clear with this with everyone, our goal is to protect our students, employees, as, and keep them as safe as possible through the mitigation of COVID risks. And so the big question is now is how, how do we do this? Well, and actually we use the same model for our school intruder and other threat assessments, our th risk of management things in our school. And so we'll, we'll use this for um, COVID as well. Um, so how we will mitigate COVID risk can best be answered by stating through the use of multiple strategies. Uh, and, and I'm gonna emphasize this uh, often, and that is we realize, I realize, we cannot eliminate the risk of COVID. Um, it will probably enter our schools, it's very likely it will, and it already has. But, uh, but we can take multiple measures to mitigate, mitigate our risks and, and stop COVID's ability to spread throughout our schools. Uh, we're confident in that. While there is debate about the effectiveness of an individual preventative steps, it's widely accepted that layered approach is the most effective. And this Swiss cheese model is not something we've created. It's actually attributed to Dr. James Reason. And this Swiss cheese model basically um, it's where the gaps in effectiveness from one approach is covered by the others. That is a model we're using to mitigate COVID risk here in the Bexley City School District. So uh, we, I used to be in the National Guard. We had a little uh, sign on our, in, our, in our armory that talked about who was the uh, safety, co safety compliance officer. Usually we had pictures of all of the people who had different roles in our, in our unit. But in that picture, it was a mirror. And when it said, who is it, uh, this unit's safety compliance officer? And I'm taking, taking that same approach 
in this process, and that is we all are. Um, staff, students, uh, it's, this is everyone's responsibility. It's gonna be a shared responsibility. Um, students can correct an adult if they see something um, that's unsafe. Uh, staff will certainly will be correcting students when they see something unsafe. And we just have to uh, all agree this is our responsibility. Ultimately, as the Director of Operations, it's my responsibility. And uh, I'm gonna be vigilant in, in, that, in those efforts. But uh, I'm expecting a lot of help um, from staff, students, and, and the parents um, in our community. All right, I'm sure by now you've seen the Bexley Health Pledge. Uh, this is this is not a legally binding waiver, and it's it's only being forced when staff and students are at school. And I, I see some of the confusion. I was inferring in there uh, public spaces. Uh, I was referring to public spaces within our school where multiple people might be. So I apologize if that's been any confusion. But this is only applicable for uh, those that are attending school or attending a school-sponsored activity. And its purpose. Uh, I said what it's not, it's not legally binding, and it's not a waiver, um, but it, what it is, is it's to serve as a weekly reminder of the imp important role that we all have in keeping each other safe uh, from COVID. And I've been asked, will there be punishments for those who not follow the pledge? Um, and so I'll answer that by saying, as a school administrator, we do have managerial rights over our employees and students while at school. And those rights also extend to parent and parents and visitors who are on our premises. Um, so for staff and students who fail to follow the pledge, there will be directives issued. And this approach, uh, this will be, uh, or this may be approached as an act of insubordination if, um, if those directives aren't followed. And thus any act of insubordination certainly can be, become a disciplinary matter. For parents and visitors, they will be asked to leave our property. Uh, if they refuse, the police will be contacted to escort this person off our premises. Uh, unfortunately, I can tell you this has already happened once this summer with contracted workers. Um, so I know that it works when I make a phone call. Uh, we've had to, we had to ask someone to leave and um, escort them off premises for not properly wearing their mask uh, around others in our building who were working. And of course, this is not our desire. We're not in the uh, mindset to be punitive. Uh, and we hope all students and families will honor and self-monitor their compliance with this pledge. All right, so um, what types of communication do we have? Let's talk about what we expect from you first. Usually I like to start with what you expect from me first, but I wanna uh, start with you. And I think our expectation well, I know our expectation is that we want you to notify us immediately if you or someone in your family has tested positive for COVID. And, and there is no shame in this. It can happen to anyone. And I, I can tell you, I, I've been as cautious as anyone can be. And uh, I know that when I go home tonight, I have my 97-year-old father-in-law who's going to be there, who's just arrived, and going to be spending a week with us as we help take care of him. Um, and I'm scared to death that, and I'm hoping that every precaution that I've taken uh, is a good one. And we'll take, certainly take precautions in the house while he's there. Um, but it's nothing to be ashamed of. I know everyone's doing the best they can. Um, so we're asking you to um, notify us. And now I, I can tell you an, another thing that's, that seems to be ironic, or at least a pattern. We've had maybe four or five cases in the athletics um, and other cases over the summer and the school and beginning of the school year. And it seems to always occur on a weekend. Weekends, it's always harder to get in touch with people and uh, for us to know, and as we know, time matters. I mean, if, if, if you've been in close contact with someone who's tested positive for COVID, I wanna get you that information as soon as possible so you avoid uh, the, the dinner with the, the parents, uh, grandparents and things like that. And so we've created a, a, B, a Bexley City School District COVID online reporting document on our website. It's on the top of the page on our main uh, landing page on our web homepage. When you fill that out and you submit it, 
it automatically sends out email notifications to um, about six or seven different people in our district. And so uh, I'm, I'm one who's constantly on my phone checking my emails all the time. It's a, a vice I wish I could break, but um, someone will see that, someone will get in touch with the rest of our contact tracing team and we'll start working uh, on the weekends if we need to and we'll communicate with everyone as soon as possible. So we're at, we just wanna point those areas out. Um, to you and make sure you know that they exist. Um, and and I, as I said, we have uh, uh, put together a document that, uh, and, and we had a lot of things to work on this summer, but we, we thought that it was best if we created a document because it also, it serves as a nice reference for me as I was trying to, to learn what happens if this happens, what should we do? And if that happens, what should we do? And so we started coming up with a bunch of questions and we use those questions to guide the creation of this document. And that document's been shared with you. This document is uh, fluid, it'll, it'll change. And we put on the uh, header of each page uh, the date that they've been changed and we're gonna make significant changes in, in red font so that you can see them if you've already read the document. Um, and there's other information around mitigating uh, risk of COVID on our Bexley City Schools um, back to school page at the top of our website. We encourage you to check those out as well. So let's spend a little bit more time on that Bexley City School District Parent Student COVID guide that I was mentioning earlier. The, um, this guide offers an overarching view of our practices. Uh, we try to put a lot of information in that. It wasn't it's not designed to be building level specific uh, for everything and answer every building level question because every building is different. And we wanted our, our administrators and teachers to have some discretion in how they implement best practices and protocols. But it was designed to provide specific district procedures and guide our teachers to review and, and encouraging our, and guiding our teachers re, to, re, to use research best practices and other public health recommendations when possible. So for example, in this document, we provided general guidance for our performing arts teachers uh, while we were waiting for more specific guidance through a study that we were waiting uh, for from the University of Col uh, Colorado study. So our performing arts teachers reviewed and will implement many of the suggestions offered in this study, even though they are not specified in our parents' student uh, COVID guide. But if you do have specific questions about the mitigation of risk with individual teachers or individual classroom uh, that your child might be taking, uh, taking, uh, taking this year, please contact that teacher. Uh, and I'm sure it'll be a, addressed in that teacher's curriculum night presentations. So this document, like I said earlier, it's, 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 it's been, it's been a, uh, it's been a, it's been a, a while to put together. And it has involved a lot of different people. And this product has been the culmination of a, a lot of people put a lot of time in and, 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 and everyone's been busy and, and we appreciate the time that we've given, but I've had teachers, I had coaches, I've had other administrators, I've had a board member, we've had uh, five or six doctors, epidemiologists, uh, that were on, within our community that, that served in the creation of this document. And uh, we've spent um, virtual meetings going over line by line and just discussing and debating what this child should just read. Is this reading the way we want it to be? Uh, to make it so that it, it, it is a, a, a hopefully a clear document for you. I know, we know it's not a perfect document. And if there are questions you have that you can't find, and what we've done is, that's a big document, it's 40 some pages, but all you really need to do is, if you could review the first three or four pages on their table of contents, we try to, to categorize um, the FAQ type questions that you can find, click the link and it'll take you right to that page. So you're not really nice if you read the whole document, but if you're trying to search for something fast, I would suggest you use the table of contents and click the link from there. Um, but if you see, if you have, see something that's not on there, send me that question. I'll bring it up to the team and we'll certainly get back to you with the answer and, and include it um, in our um, handbook when we meet, um, in which we, we, we're continuing to meet during this time as well. I, I wanted to say this. And I also want to, I, I don't, 
you know, the, even though this document represents our collective wisdom, we know it's not perfect. Um, I just, I can't thank the members of our task force enough for helping me and, 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 and helping me uh, become more knowledgeable in this area and, um, and, the, and to create this document. And there are too many to acknowledge, but there is a page in this guide acknowledging their service to our district. So once again, I'd like to uh, thank this group and let everyone know that um, this is not a final document. We, we will, we're scheduled to meet every few weeks to talk about new findings, new guidance, new questions that maybe we haven't thought of. Um, so if you, if you have new questions you can't find, get in touch with me. Okay, well, um, the first mitigation that we have risk that we have in place it's, and, and, and this is what we're, we're, we're preaching to everyone, is assume everyone you come in contact with has COVID. Behave that way. And if you do, more likely you're going to stay safe and you're, not, and you're going to re stop the spread um, should, should, should you become exposed. So, you know, if I, that means I'm wearing a mask and I'm around someone, I'm um, keeping my distance. If I have to be within six feet of someone, I got a clock in my head that starts ticking for 15 minutes. And I know that's, that's a general statement, but that's the guidelines that we're using. Uh, and we know there, there are situations where that's not gonna be the case, um, but that's what we're using for contact tracing. Um, and we think this is something that everyone can understand. Um, and uh, we're gonna help our younger students with this as well. All right, we have other layers of mitigation that we have. We have a lot of different layers of mitigation or pieces of slices of cheese, if you will, that we have in place. One where we are requiring uh, everyone on school property wear a face mask. Um, and they must be properly worn. Uh, and when I say worn at all times of school, uh, that includes recess. The only time uh, these face masks can be removed is during lunch. Uh, when medical, when, while students are sitting and eating, um, or when they're outside and physically distanced and have the permission of an employee to remove them. Uh, we want this to be controlled and under supervision when we do that. Um, and again, as I stated earlier, not wearing a mask will be considered an act of subordination. And if you read that document, we have come up with medical, um, exemptions to this um, and uh, I'll address uh, I'll address those here in a little bit um, but we do encourage staff and students to bring their own masks to school um, but we have purchased over 10,000 masks that can be distributed to those who, who are in need uh, who string breaks uh, who forget to bring their masks things like that I had a, I had a question too about neck, neck gaiters and the study behind that um, so let me explain why we're not permitting neck gaiters. Uh, we, we did see a study in, in, from Duke that indicated that single ply neck gaiters were basically as effective as not wearing anything at all in the spread of respiratory droplets. Um, and, and, and again, we didn't go through and do a peer review of the study or anything like that. And we chose to take, it, take that study at its word, but we chose, um, but we, they did talk about a double ply gator being more effective. Well, we thought about it for a while. We thought, well, we can't, we can't determine whether a gator someone's wearing is a single ply or double ply. So the easiest thing to do is just not allow them to be worn. So that's where we are in that position. And, and, and back to this, that people have medically documented reasons for not wearing a mask. Uh, these individuals are entitled by law uh, to accommodations and certainly privacy. And so if, if there is that need, um, people will not, it won't be publicly, it won't be a public notice issued about this, but I assure you that we will have, um, for those that have medically documented reasons not to wear a mask, we will have multiple layers of uh, accommodations put in place in privacy if that um, if that needs to occur. Um, certainly, if that was the need, we might get people uh, remote working assignments, um, offer things such as extended learning and things like that. But that is um, something that we're prepared for and we'll be able to address 
And then again, this process is developed to make any accommodation to ensure that any individual and others are safe while participating in their education. Um, six feet of distancing again, we'll keep harping on that. Um, and again, if you can't do this, we're, you know, I don't want people, I don't want our students when they pass somebody in the hallway to panic and say, oh my gosh, that person was less than a foot away from us. And so we're gonna be stressing uh, for, you know, for, for more than 15 minutes. So if you have to be by someone, let's do so in less than 15 minutes. Um, this standard is used for everyone in our district. Uh, monitoring this, as stated earlier, is everyone's responsibility, but we understand that our younger students will need help in monitoring their behaviors and keeping track of this time. So our teachers are prepared to assist our younger students with this. Um, and also we're gonna be emphasizing washing and sanitizing our hands often. Um, every classroom has hand sanitizer. It has soap and water dispensers, uh, spray bottles, has paper towels. Uh, we, it, we, set out every single um, disinfectant wipe that we have while we're, we've ordered a ton more. We're just waiting for them to get here. Um, so we, we're trying to set the rooms up so that can happen. And so our teachers will probably use phrases with the students about wash in and wash out or sanitize in and sanitize out. The expectation will be that every time somebody enters a room, they're gonna use hand sanitizer. And every time somebody exits the room, they're gonna use hand sanitizer. Um, we put hand sanitizer stations throughout our hallways, uh, outside every entrances. Uh, we know some of our students will still have to keep our doors secure and the keypads will be used. And so when students, you know, put their bikes in the bike rack, they open the door, they, they or excuse me, they probably use the keypad first, they unlock the door, then they open the door, and then uh, right there will be a uh, sanitizing station for them to sanitize their hands. So if you can help keep telling your students that they're there for a reason, so use them. Um, our custodial team will be frequently cleaning touch surfaces, such as handrails and restrooms, doorknobs, cafeteria tables, often throughout the school day. Uh, we'll create additional barrier, barriers, such as desk and, and uh, cafeteria, excuse me, cafeteria table dividers for each student as well. The, the barriers for in the classroom on the desks are transparent, so it allows teachers to see in and uh, students to see out. Um, they might not be perfect, but I, I think that they uh, are another layer of uh, mitigation that we purchased. I think we purchased uh, almost 1,500 of those, and those are who will be distributed to our teachers in our classrooms uh, next week. And prepare, so they'll be prepared for the start of school. Uh, also, uh, we have a lot of open areas uh, that need uh, additional barriers, such as those occupied by our secretaries and cashiers. And we, our custodial team has been creating transparent barriers using plexiglass and shower curtains. Um, and I, I'll, I'll tell you that uh, uh, we've been using shower curtains now as much as possible. Uh, plexiglass supply is low. Uh, and if remember your economics 101, the uh, plexiglass prices have skyrocketed from 30 to $40 a sheet before this to over 200 and some dollars right now is one, one, last, one of our last estimates. So they're hard to get right now. So we, we've created and been creative and our custodial team and maintenance team have created um, portable as well as stationary um, barriers using uh, shower curtains and the, the limited plexiglass that we have. Um, pretty cool stuff and, and, and uh, we're happy and appreciative of their efforts. Another question that we get uh, asked a lot <clears throat> is about our classrooms that don't have windows. Um, yeah, it's, it's, again, it's not perfect. Um, we wish all of our classrooms have windows, but that's not the case. But when this first happened, I think I was reading uh, I mean, uh, John Eikenberry, business manager, uh, we're talking about an article, I think it might have happened in China, where the virus was spread at that time was reported through the ventilation system. Uh, we immediately brought in an HVAC consultant back in April, and we wanted to review all of our HVA systems to find out um, were we uh, 
in a safe area in a safe zone for this? What procedures should we take during a COVID era? Stuff like that. And so uh, we learned a little bit about that too. So uh, I'll probably talk to you like I, I know what I'm talking about, but I know enough now that say that these filters are given a MERV, a MERV rating uh, from one to 16. And there, our consultant stated that in a COVID environment, we must have at least a MERV 13 uh, rated or higher um, filter. Well, what we discovered is that all of our filter and, and the system itself has to be able to handle the filter. So I can't put a M, I can't put a MERV 16 uh, rating at all uh, HVA systems. The newer ones maybe, but some of the older ones no. So it's not like you can pick and choose. Your system has to support the appropriate MERV rated filter. And uh, uh, we were very pleased to find out that all of our um, systems. Uh, could handle a MERV 13 rating and two of our buildings could handle a MERV 15 rated filter. So we put those in <clears throat> and we're going to follow their prescribed filter changing procedures as well. Um, we're also encouraging our teachers to open windows um, when weather permits, as long as those windows can be opened and remain safe, open safely. You know, some of these buildings are quite old. Um, so we want uh, make sure the windows can be open safely, stay open safely. Um, we researched the practicality of air purifiers in uh, rooms, especially those without um, windows and found that air purifiers don't offer much protection in most circumstances. And so, but we, what we had done is uh, in our larger areas um, where the spread might be more um, risky, such as our, um, gyms and theaters and choir and band rooms. We purchased uh, a couple dozen of those large industrial size oscillating fans that can be used to help um, dissipate those, those droplets. And so those will be uh, placed out there and, and, and help reduce the spread as well. And I think I said cafeteria, but it'll be in our cafeterias as well. Um, as I stated earlier, cleaning efforts is a, is a team process and we're taking an all hands on deck approach. Um, our custodial team has established a cleaning protocol based upon CDC guidelines. Uh, we're using uh, CDC um, approved um, chemicals and agents to disinfect the buildings and things like that. Um, we escalated our cleaning to be used during the pandemic threat. And, this, and, 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 and we're learning things during this coronavirus that I'm sure now that we're gonna certainly apply during the regular flu seasons moving forward. I mean, it's not that we ignored the flu season, but we've learned things that would help during those times as well in the future. We purchased four disinfectant foggers that uh, really expedites uh, the disinfecting of a room. Um, We've done studies, we've calculated that disinfecting a room basically takes an additional 20 minutes on top of the, uh, an average of 20 minutes per room on top of, the, of the, the cleaning that happens. So asking our students and staff to wipe down desks and stuff before they leave a day, if that saves our custodians um, any time at all, that, free, that, that saves us time uh, in our, in our uh, disinfecting areas as, as well. The disinfecting will not occur every day. We'll be using soap and water and other uh, uh, cleaning pro processes in the rooms on, on most nights, but when we need to do it, it, it can happen uh, expeditiously now. Um, again, our custodial staff will disinfect all of our work areas, our countertops, our restrooms and doorknobs, water filling stations, stair railing several times daily. Um, They'll clean all hallways, common areas, and outside of lockers um, using, our, like I say, CDC approved products um, based on the CDC reopening guidance that we received. So during a hybrid instructional model, our custodial team will increase high contact areas throughout the day, increase cleaning of those areas. Um, to help manage this, we are increasing our first shift custodial staff by three. Um, once school begins to assist with this. And even with this support, we're still keeping an all hands on deck approach and getting everyone to help us wipe down desks, light switches, use classroom materials and things like that during the day. 
Deep cleaning and disinfection spraying will occur each Wednesday and on the weekends during the first and second shifts uh, on those days. There will be some weeks that are shortened and will not allow us a full day to clean and disinfect between groups. Um, our plan during these weeks is that we'll conduct our cleaning and disinfecting during the second and third shifts and we'll uh, obviously have to increase our manpower uh, to get this done through limited through the limited time that we'll have, but we'll use subs and overtime if necessary to, to make this happen. So you can rest assured that um, it will be they will be sanitized um, between breaks between A groups and B groups. Um, important to know, uh, parents. You know, we've been a uh, always encouraging uh, volunteers and people to visit our school and to watch assemblies and, and be a part of their child's experience here at school. Um, but during this hybrid model in a COVID world, we are limiting visitors to our building. Uh, limiting, not eliminating. We'll be limiting visitors, but we will be eliminating volunteers uh, until further notice. Uh, principals will have discretion as to who can have access to their buildings, visitors I'm speaking of right now. And they have been uh, encouraged to have all the meetings. Uh, we want them to occur virtually, if at all possible. Uh, one of the other things that we were worried about, we know there's a lot of travel uh, that occurs in our community. And um, so we would just like to be informed when you're having these meetings. Uh, it's not something we can enforce. I, I, we're not policing this, uh, we're requesting, and we hope that the reason for our request uh, are valid enough that you honor them. And that is basically, we just wanna uh, know that uh, we're, if you're going to a COVID hotspot, um, what precautions you'll be taking during the trip, and then we might have a, a, a plan that could include um, well, we could say, you know what, based on where you're going, and even though you're taking all the steps, we think it's best that you quarantine for 14 days. Uh, it could be, you know what, you're not going to a hot spot. We think you're going to be fine, but you're going to a wedding, and there's going to be a lot of people there. And we're worried about that. Maybe we'll allow your child to come to school during those days, and we'll frequently uh, temperature check and symptom check throughout the day, um, if that's okay. You know, or we might say, you know what, based on what you're telling us and where you're going and how you're getting there, that this, we're not as concerned, but thanks for letting us know and we'll just return to school as normal. But we'd like to, we'd like to be involved in those conversations so that um, we're just in the know. And uh, so we would appreciate that. Um, we had planned for hallway and stair traffic flow patterns for each school and through the use of these decals, it's a picture here on this screen here, uh, we've marked hallways to guide us travelers. Um, this is gonna be really important at the middle school and high school, uh, since they're traveling uh, to class to class as they normally would. Um, and this will only be used for class transitions when we have approximately 337, 375 kids in, in the hallways at the middle school and high school during a class change. Um, we're going to resort to these type of traffic, but let's imagine it's in the middle of the class period and the student has permission to use the restroom um, and the hallways are clear. Um, we're, not, we're expecting them to get to the restroom and get back, uh, maintaining their six feet of distancing as quickly as possible. They can, they can travel to that restroom in the, in the, you know, the, the quickest route uh, possible. So this is, these would be designed primarily for class changes, or if we have large group of kids in a hallway that we need to use. Um, you know, and, and some hallways will, you know, we just can't do it. If you've been in our building before, you know, it's, it's been put together like a puzzle sometimes, and we can't have all of our hallways one way. Some of them will be two-way traffic, and especially at Maryland Avenue, there's just no way to, to make those hallways, so we'll be dividing the hallways with blue tape and encouraging kids to stay on the right or left-hand side as they're crossing each other. Um, to mitigate the risk of student groupings, building principals, I said, I've implemented a few policies that I'm, that I'm aware of as well. And I know some have extended time between class periods um, 
to get students more time to get to where they're going uh, and, and to allow them to use this traffic flow pattern that we've designed. Uh, not permitting students to use a restroom during class change so that um, you know, the capacities that we've set for each restroom can be better managed. Um, I, I believe restrooms will occur once class begins, uh, as I said, to better manage the number of students using the restroom at any given time. Uh, restrooms do have signs indicating maximum capacity and set up to ensure physical distancing. Um, some urinals have been uh, taped off, closed off. Um, our, uh, most of our toilets have automatic flush sensors now, and, but some sinks do have spigots. And those that do have spigots um, that need to be turned off manually um, do have paper towel dispensers nearby allowing students to wash their hands, dry their hands with a paper towel and use that paper towel to turn the spigot off and uh, before throwing that towel away. Uh, administrators are not permitting the use of lockers during this time to keep the hallway traffic flowing. Um, I got a lot of questions about that and students at the middle school and high school will be permitted to carry a book bag as well as their coat. Um, the high school is committed to reducing the need for textbooks in their classes and the middle school is only requiring workbooks, thus lightening the load. Uh, so, so thus, um, all the school needs that the student is required to have uh, to serve their role as a learner should fit comfortably in the student's book bag. Uh, and principals have been encouraged to create a uh, staggered entry point for students. Um, I'm not sure the specifics and how they're managing that right now, um, but I've heard conversations where they were planning to have maybe a certain grade level enter through these doors, um, or as, and another grade level entering through these doors to, so that there's not a, a, a large group of students entering the building at any one time. I know we discussed the possibility of staggering times, uh, and that's kind of hard, and we're already reducing so much instructional time. Uh, I, I think we're, if, they're, if they are using staggered times, it'll probably be very minimal differences in time, um, but we're focusing on staggered entry at this point. Um, and again, as I stated earlier, um, they are reducing number of students in the hallway at any given time as best as they can. Um, we are turning off all water fountains. Um, and we do have a few water bottle filling stations. Um, we ordered uh, back in early July water filling uh, more, I think seven, eight more that we're gonna install in the other buildings as well. Um, unfortunately, we they were supposed to get those in um, by the uh, middle of August. Uh, we've been checking um, every other day with the company. I've been told today that they have a couple in and they will get to us once they get them in, we can get them installed quickly and the other ones we've ordered will be coming uh, in the next week or two. So uh, I guess this is where I'm gonna ask uh, for your help as well. Um, we're asking parents to send a water bottle to school with their students in, in, in the time being, for the time being. And if you could write the name of the students write your student's name on the water bottle, that would be helpful. And, and now, now that I mentioned about being helpful, I wanna suggest you go ahead and write your name on, the, on your child's coats and lunch boxes because you'd be amazed at the items that, we, that fill our lost and found. And if we could just find a name, we could make sure it gets, gets back to the right students. Um, just another tip there, I guess. Um, also, our clinic procedures have changed, and I can't thank our nurses enough for all that they've done and all the help they've given over the summer and uh, communication, but they put together a really good plan as well, and I'll share with you some of those points. Uh, they uh, are sitting students, uh, seating will be implemented in the hall outside of the health clinic as needed to, to help physical distancing occur in the clinics. Um, Clinic visits will be limited to those who require medical treatment only. Behavior and mental health issues will be referred to a school counselor or building principal. Um, they're gonna be discouraging teachers from sending students into the clinic in pairs or groups when possible. Um, students, we know students who are injured or ill, uh, if they're able to be sent alone, they will be and not with a friend 
Again, exceptions will apply. Students that uh, are staff member with diabetes, uh, one who might be actively bleeding or anyone requiring physical assistance will certainly have someone escorting them to the clinic. And during the time, due to, during this time, due to the pandemic, uh, we're asking another favor of you, and that is to administer your morning medications at home if at all possible. Students uh, who must receive medications at school will receive those medications in the health clinic at staggered times, and the nurses will be working with those parents to determine that time. Uh, and again, as a way to limit um, cohorting or grouping uh, in the clinic. Um, while the health clinic uh, while in a health clinic, students and staff with chronic medical conditions will be adequately isolated from any ill students. Uh, it's, if a student appears ill or has complaints of illness while they're in a classroom and the symptoms are COVID-like, uh, the teacher will contact the health clinic and a clinic staff member will, will retrieve the ill student from the classroom. Each building will have a designated isolation room that will house the student until the parent arrives to retrieve their child. And again. We need your help with this. We understand that this is not convenient for parents who are working and need to be at work and, and we'll apologize in advance, but um, we're asking that you make plans for someone to be able to pick up your child um, should we call you within an hour of that notification. And what's important to keep in mind too is that that list that you, that you create uh, you need to contact your, your uh, nurse or put in an email to the building secretary, your, your child's secretary, and make sure that those people, have, you give them permission to, um, give us permission to release your child to those, to those people on your list. Um, please, and please make note of that. Uh, our, the cafeteria procedures will also be changing. Um, we will set up the cafeteria to ensure at least six feet of distancing occur when others are eating. Um, elementary, it, that, that's being the middle school and high school students. Elementary students uh, will have their lunches served in their classrooms. Uh, and once served, they'll be encouraged to go outside to eat when possible. Our middle school and high school students will utilize our cafeteria and overfill areas if necessary. Our cafeteria seats uh, we'll, seats will be spaced out at six feet uh, between seats. Uh, high school students um, still have the option of, of going out for lunch, um, have an open lunch. And um, it's important to say that not only are we spacing the seats out in the cafeteria, we're putting uh, uh, dividers, table dividers up on top of the tables to further protect our students while they're eating with their masks off. And as you can see that we're not permitting any outside groups to rent our space. Um, and unfortunately that also includes Bexley Rec um, as well. Um, well, that brings our presentation to an end. Um, I tried to answer as many questions as I could in the hour that we, that we had. And uh, um, like I say, I'm gonna be posting a copy of this on our website if somebody would like to watch it or couldn't watch it later. I encourage you to review the Bexley City School District uh, Parent Student COVID Guide uh, should you have any questions. Um, but if you can't find an answer there, please feel free to contact me at, at oh, I have a typo there and I apologize for that and I'll correct it. Uh, no, I guess it is, it's correct there at harley.williams at bexley.us. Um, so with that, I will, and again, if you send me a question, I'll get back to you as expeditiously as I can. Um, and with that, I'd like to again thank you for your time and uh, wish you a good night and a, a successful start to our hybrid, which again is, uh, is scheduled to occur on Monday, September 21st. Good night.